Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the fifth online meeting of the Alliance's 2017 Rackery Housing for Youth Learning Community. I'm Mindy Mitchell, Program and Policy Analyst here at the National Alliance in Homelessness, and I'm joined today by another of our awesome program associates, Catherine Kinney, Katie. So we'll just get started with a couple of housekeeping tips about the webinar platform. All participants will be muted except for speakers and panelists during presentations. But at any time during the webinar, you can enter questions for speakers into the question box on the right of your screen. Um, Katie's going to be gathering those questions, and our panelists will be answering as many of them as they can at the end of all the presentations. Additionally, the webinar and the slides um, will be available after the broadcast. And also, I made a PDF of all the slides, which you can find in the handout box of the webinar platform. So today's topic is one that anyone who is doing rapid re rehousing always gets questions and concerns about, um, and that's housing first and harm reduction. So those approaches go hand in hand at the practice level, and also when we're examining our underlying assumptions about what people experiencing homelessness need. Um, and housing first and harm reductions are also key components of an effective rapid rehousing model for youth in, in any population. Um, those can also be the most rewarding part of doing the work, even though they're challenging. So we're really excited to have this really important conversation today with so many great experts. Um, first, we're happy to have Susan Sterrett, who is the Associate Director for Federal Technical Assistance at CSH. She's going to be giving us a brief overview of a great new tool from HUD that you can use to assess your program or your community's fidelity to Housing First. Then we'll hear from the Alliance's own Ben cattell Knoll, Techn Technical Assistance Specialist at our Center for Capacity Building. Ben's going to talk about harm reduction specifically and why it's such an important part of Housing First. Next, we'll feature the program of one of our founding members of the Rappery Housing for Youth Learning Community, Lynn Brockmeyer, who wears um, so many hats at Riverside University Health System Behavioral Health that I don't even know which one to use for her title. Um, then we're going to have a whole group of longtime youth rapidly housing providers from the learning community that you'll all be familiar with by now, and they're going to join us to share their um, expertise about a few of the most common things that come up when we talk about implementing Housing First for young people. And those are going to be Julie Bach from Pathfinders in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Beth Holger Ambrose from the Lincoln, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and John Lawler from The Connection in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, Laura Foster from Bill Wilson Center in Santa Clara may also be joining us, but she's likely going to be a later arrival. So finally, we'll open up the conversation for your questions with the panel of experts. Um, and again, you can submit those questions at any time in the box on the right of your screen. Okay, let's get started. Um, here's our agenda for today, which I basically just covered, and um, let's all save our naps for afterwards. Um, now I'm going to pass things over to Susan from CSH to get the ball rolling. And Susan, let me make sure I'm unmuting you. Did I do that? Great. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear um, me? Yeah, I can. First of all, um, I don't. I don't think the attendees can access hyperlinks from the presentation itself. So Katie is going to post the link to the assessment tool in the chat box now for everybody. Um, Susan, welcome to the Rappery Housing for Youth Learning Community. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about HUD and Housing First and this cool new assessment tool. And I will hopefully get all the bullets going right. Okay, sounds great, thanks. Um, so uh, hopefully you all saw the uh, listserv message that came out um, last week from uh, the HUD Exchange that there has been a new Housing First assessment tool that's been released. Um, I think it's super important to know that uh, if you look at HUD's definition of housing first, and the best place to find that is the 2017 COC competition program, NOFA, um, which I'm sure that you all are very familiar with at the moment. Um, it's, uh, so this is what it says, I'm just gonna read it. Housing first prioritizes rapid placement and stabilization in permanent housing, does not have service participation requirements or preconditions. COC program funded projects should help individuals and families move quickly into permanent housing. The COC should measure and help projects reduce the length of time people experience homelessness 
And additionally, COCs should engage landlords and property owners, remove barriers to entry, and adopt client-centered service methods. So those three sentences uh, is HUD's definition of housing first, um, which is uh, great to help uh, give a general overview of what they are looking for, um, but does not necessarily go into the actual practice of how you do those things. And so the Housing First Assessment Tool takes that language from HUD. Uh, there's been other things that HUD has put out on Housing First. There was a snaps and focus message sent out by Norm probably about a year ago now that um, provided a little bit more detail um, on all of those different components. USICH has released a Housing First checklist that's available on their website. Um, obviously, there are practitioners of Housing First that has also done research and put information out there about the kind of practice of Housing First that goes beyond just like the philosophy of what we mean by Housing First. And uh, so taking into account all of those different tools that are out there and kind of just narrative on Housing First, uh, HUD put together uh, this Housing First Assessment Tool. Now, what I will say about it is that it does go beyond uh, what HUD has uh, put out there in those three sentences. And so what this tool will, can do is to help provide both a baseline on where projects are in implementing Housing First, both as a philosophy and um, in practice, and to also, um, uh, at different points in time, help to measure the progress that those projects have made in uh, kind of becoming more compliant, for lack of a better word, uh, with Housing First. Um, and so uh, this tool can be used by both uh, the Continuum of Care uh, to measure uh, specific projects, uh, implementation of Housing First, the project can also use it both in that baseline and to measure their progress um, themselves. One of the things that's super important uh, also is that this is uh, at a very general level. Uh, continuums of care may have more requirements around what they mean by housing first and how to implement housing first in their written standards. And so if that is the case in your continuum, we also really suggest that the continuum um, think about how to measure their, their own written standards um, uh, at the project level. So just a couple of things about the tool. Um, there are uh, three different ways that for each of the standards that are listed there that uh, the tool can be used to measure kind of that alignment with Housing First principles and practice. So we call it say it, do it, and document it. Um, so when, uh, I'm gonna actually go um, skip around there. So documenting it means that you have policies, you have procedures, you have protocols in place that document that you are not asking people to, uh, when they come into your project to like do a P-test or anything like that. Um, they also, uh, we also are looking at how uh, project staff say uh, what they're doing. So how are they talking about uh, barriers that they may or may not have um, in accessing the project and staying in the project? And then what's the evidence uh, that actually shows that what you documented and how you're talking about it, that you're actually doing it, right? So not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. Um, You'll see as you uh, open up the tool and dive into it that there are four different tabs at the bottom of that tool um, that are where the standards are. So we're talking about standards related to accessing the project. We're um, there are standards related to um, evaluating um, the project itself. Uh, the services that are being provided, and then the housing uh, component of it that does include uh, leasing as well. And the tool can also uh, uh, kind of sort through all of those different standards based on the project uh, type. 
that uh, is being operated as well as specific subpopulations. So there's an instruction tab that walks you through all of that. The second tab is the provider information. If you don't fill out the provider information tab, you're not going to be able to see things um, by project type or by subpopulation. So on the pro um, provider information tab, there's two really important pieces that you need to fill out. Um, they are highlighted in orange. Uh, so which best describes the project, and this is the project type. Um, so for all of you all on this call, you would be choosing rapid rehousing. Um, and then uh, the second uh, highlighted orange uh, row is, are your services targeted to any of the following populations specifically? Um, and so if you're operating projects for youth, then you could choose youth and young adults. What that does when you choose uh, from those drop downs is that it automatically on the rest of the tabs will only show you the standards that are related to that project type and additional standards related to the subpopulation um, or target population that you are serving. So, uh, and then you walk through each of the tabs, right? So rapid rehousing, you have to answer questions on all of the four tabs, um, the access and input, leases, services and housing, and the project specific tab. Uh, so you're going to go through for each of the standards. You're going to say, we always do this, we somewhat do this, we don't really do this at all. Um, in both the say it, do it, document it. Uh, and uh, when you have walked through all of those tabs, there is also a report summary that uh, graphically will show you how well you are doing meeting uh, the Housing First uh, principles and philosophy. Uh, we'll show you also the areas where um, you still have some work to be done. So you can print out that report summary page and again, use that to track your progress um, and figure out what action steps you need to take in order to uh, completely um, meet those standards. I hope that that was helpful. <laughs> that was awesome. awesome, Susan. Thank you so much. And just to let everyone um, in the community know, um, this just came out and we wanted to have Susan on just to give a quick overview and let you all know that this is available. Um, I think Susan will CSH and HUD be doing an ongoing kind of uh, delving deeper into it, training Absolutely. and stuff so, about the yep, tool. Actually, okay. starting in October, there will be opportunities for COC leads. Uh, to get on a call about it, and then they can do the training with their projects. Awesome. And so everybody stay tuned for uh, more information about that and upcoming Rapid Housing for Youth Learning Community newsletters. Um, thanks again, Susan. Um, it'll be so exciting to see uh, how folks use this tool at the community and program level. Um, next up, we have the Alliance's Ben cattell -Null. Ben. Welcome to the learning community, and uh, we're looking forward to your overview on harm reduction. All right, thank you. I appreciate to... that. Oh, did you do it? Okay. <laughs> I, I unmuted Sorry, myself. I have... Thank you. No All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for taking the time to come here and talk about harm reduction, which is uh, one of my favorite things to, to talk about. So I'm going to tr just try and give a very brief, like, five, six minute overview of some of the basic principles and practices of harm reduction. So um, hopefully this is a phrase and a term that you all are familiar with. Um, I, I pulled the, the definition from the Harm Reduction Coalition's website, really great website, um, if you are looking to learn more about harm reduction. Um, but they, they, call, they say that harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Um, so what does that really mean, though? So I, I just want to start by by personalizing the concept of harm reduction a little bit for you all. Um, so of, of you folks listening in, I assume that many are probably listening from your offices today. Um, and so I just wonder how many of you wore your seatbelt uh, when you drove to work today? Uh, probably and hopefully the vast majority of you or even all of you. Um, but, you know, driving is actually one of the most dangerous activities that that we could do and many of us do it every day um you know and we do it because the benefits are worth the risk to us um, but we do take steps to mitigate some of the risks that come with driving uh, a seatbelt being one of the big ones um i'm sure there's probably also folks listening in today that have uh 
really wanted a donut or a piece of candy, um, but have instead chose to eat a piece of fruit instead for their for their dessert. Um, there might be some Diet Coke drinkers on the call, um, you know, and one of the things that we know is that overconsumption of sugar is a major problem in our society, and it can lead to things like obesity and heart disease and diabetes and a host of other challenges that can affect uh, our health pretty significantly. So we try and make informed decisions and informed choices. So we don't always eat the donut or we eat one donut instead of two. Um, and these are harm reduction strategies. They're harm reduction strategies that you are already doing. And so the same principles that I'm going to talk about now apply when we talk about drug use and alcohol use, sex, and the list could go on. Um, a, a quote that I really like from uh, two authors, Pat Denning and Jeannie Little, um, they wrote a book called Over the Influence. Uh, they say that one cannot be for or against harm reduction. It is what we do all the time. So the first principle I want to talk about is that harm reduction accepts that drug use and other potentially harmful behaviors are part of life. Um, so I just want to be really abundantly clear. Harm reduction is not simply a softer and gentler way to get people to stop using entirely. Abstinence is not necessarily the goal of harm reduction. Now, it may be, um, but, but harm reduction um, and, and people's choices around drug, alcohol use, um, are based on their own goals and their own values, which may or may not include abstinence. Um, but I also want to be abundantly clear that acceptance does not mean approval. Um, so sometimes harm reduction is is derogatively uh, derogatively uh, looked at as a as an enabling strategy. Um, and and I want to just be really clear that this is not about enabling behavior. It's not about saying absolutely do whatever you want. I don't care. Um, what acceptance is 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 the opposite of judgment. Um, and by by reserving judgment, by being non-judgmental, um, it means that we can actually have an open and honest conversation with somebody about the choices that they're making, um, rather than simply ignoring behavior and hoping that it goes away and that people are safe, or just condemning that behavior and making somebody feel bad, which typically is going to have no actual impact on their decision to use or not, um, and really just encourages them to hide that usage from us and not be able to have a conversation about it. Um, so, you know, harm reduction as an approach, it's collaborative, it's person-centered, it's non-judgmental, and these should all sound uh, really familiar as sort of principles and cornerstones of a housing-first approach as well. Um, so the second thing to talk about is that is that harm reduction – acknowledges that some ways of using are safer than others. Um, the, the psychiatrist, the addiction psychiatrist Norman Zinberg uh, developed a framework that he refers to as drug set and setting, um, which is sort of a cornerstone of harm reduction. So it looks at the drug we talk about when we talk about the drug that's looking at pharmacology, the, the drug itself set is the individual user and the setting is the context of that use. So um, as you're talking with youth who may be using drugs or, or alcohol in, in ways that you think are problematic, you want to break it down and really look at, at specifics and ask specific questions. So, you know, with, with drugs, it matters how you are taking the drug, right? So injection versus snorting versus smoking versus pills or ingesting, um, our bodies absorb things differently and respond differently based on the method of taking the drug. And so it's really important to understand that there are some ways of using that are safer or more risky than others. Um, you know, what's the purity of the drug? Uh, probably many of you are familiar with uh, the drug fentanyl, which has uh, been, been in a lot of the heroin supply recently and has led to a lot of overdoses. Um, you may be working with, with youth who are using K2. And one of the big challenges with K2 is that we don't understand um, exactly what all is in it. And, and how our bodies respond. Um, you want to make sure you know somebody's tolerance for a drug. So um, one of the most dangerous, uh, the, the highest risk for overdose is for folks who have quit using cold turkey, whether because by choice or because they're locked up or don't have access uh, otherwise to a drug. Um, those folks may return to using at the levels that they used to use at, um, but their tolerance has decreased, and so uh, they may be at an increased risk of overdose. Um, you know, also a similar thing, uh, combining things may have a synergistic effect. So, um, 
combining alcohol and heroin, for instance, is is incredibly risky. Those are two depressants, and they both impact uh, the how strong of a response your body has to the other, and can and can lead to overdose. Um, and and the setting, uh, you know, the context of the drug use, you know, who else is around when somebody is using? Uh, do those people have access uh, both to the skills and the actual uh, drug uh, of life-saving overdose reversal drugs like naloxone? Um, so I would hope that everybody um, that, that's working with youth would have access to this drug and would have training in how to use it. Um, a, a friend of mine, Kiefer Patterson, who does harm reduction work, uh, I think puts it most clearly and effectively. He says, dead people don't recover. So if we want to help people recover, we need to make sure they stay alive. Um, so again, just to, to kind of highlight this again, harm reduction is looking at, uh, it understands use is complex and, and, and looks at behaviors as being on a continuum. So there are not just two options. There's not just you are uh, addicted or you are a drug user or you are abstinent. Um, so there's a whole continuum from, from usage that may be very intense and potentially problematic or dangerous to total abstinence. And, and all of those are compatible with a harm reduction approach. I also just want to really underscore that to you all, that abstinence is not incompatible with harm reduction. Um, you can have conversations with people about relapse prevention plans. If somebody uh, wants to attend AA or NA meetings uh, or use medication-assisted treatment um, as as part of their recovery and they want to abstain from use altogether, that's absolutely compatible with a harm reduction approach. What it really comes down to is um, what is that person's specific individual goals uh, for their life. And so that's why, um, and, and Mindy, you can put up the last one as well, the last bullet point. Um, that, that harm reduction and housing first really are a hand in glove approach. As you heard Susan say, um, housing first is really about there being no preconditions to housing. And uh, that means no preconditions, not preconditions, uh, very few preconditions. Uh, it does not mean that we wait till people stop using in a problematic way. It does not mean we wait until people have 30 days clean and sober. So we are certain that they are not gonna relapse. Um, it means no preconditions, um, and, and harm reduction is, I think, actually an incredibly effective tool within Housing First, an essential tool, because um, if we recognize that there are no preconditions to entering housing, then we are going to be working with people who are, who are uh, using in ways that may be problematic, and harm reduction gives us the tools to help those people stay housed and stay healthy. Um, so I, I, I guess that's what I'll that's what I'll I'll, I'll stop there um, and and turn it over so we can hear from folks who are who are doing this every day. Um, but but I'm I'm sure there'll be questions and and comments later that I'll be happy to stick around and and take. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. And uh, we're so happy to have you here at the Alliance now. Um, and thank you for bringing up one of my favorite people on the planet, Kiefer, um, who is super busy doing his important work at Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and and um, is, I know, happy to be a resource for folks, so we can make that connection to him as well. Um, one of my favorite things about harm reduction is that it is another one of those approaches that really challenges us to examine our own deeply held beliefs about what we think people need from us. Um, and I think this conversation so far has provided a really great frame for our next pre presenter, um, Lynn Brockmeyer from Riverside University Health System. Um, See, I want to, sorry, y'all, I can never get my game together on the muting thing. Um, Lynn, I have unmuted you and you can take it away. Thank you. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> um, this is basically our program. I've been working with the department with our homeless housing opportunities and partnership and education program, and we just call it HOPE here. And our real focus is that wellness does begin with a home. And we have a really comprehensive housing service continuum here, including a, a large housing crisis response or street outreach and engagement team. We also are our COC's local um, CES lead. So um, we're, we dive in wholeheartedly. We don't do things halfway here. <laughs> Next slide. 
So one of the things that I think is really important as you're moving forward and looking at how to address um, some of the... Hang on, Lynn. Hold on. I'm trying to figure out how to make this stop. <laughs> hold on. That would be good. <laughs> One of, one of the key components that I wanted to focus on today is how, how what happens on the street with an individual plays into what they're doing when you have them in housing. So for us, it's really critical that we remember these pieces, and that's why I'm going to share them with you today. So we started and made um, five or six years ago a real paradigm shift and how we were planning and organizing and working. And we really began focusing on the individual being in a actual housing crisis. And not just that large global, the homeless, um, but really focusing on that person and what that housing crisis is. And that really allows us to invite some kind of conversation with youth around who's um, what their choices are and those that are choosing not not to be sober. And that's how we kind of look at it. Next slide. Um, it really is an, a unique and individual um, uh, piece. I'm not sure why it's going way ahead. Um, so we, we've recognized that focusing on the homeless globally really limits the ability to address the individual. And that's one of the, the key things that we're identifying um, because we do work with individuals on the street as they come into our housing programs. Next. And we really focus on that crisis service, that it is a crisis, that each individual on, um, or household on the street is in a crisis. They live in that state day to day. It's a state of survival, moment to moment. And it really has to affect how we serve them um, and their ability to, to have choice. And so when you're serving them from the street through housing, you need to remember that to be effective, that it is about that state of crisis. Next slide. Just one this time. Okay, uh, Lynn, hang on just a second. I'm going to take it out of presentation mode just a second to try to stop it from doing the, the, the shifting. Sure. So everybody can see my um, kitty cat wallpaper. Uh, Who appears to be in crisis. <laughs> As I often am when I am rock climbing. Um, Hang on, everybody. I don't see how to remove it. Transition. Uh, and slide on mouse click. While she's working on that, I'll just explain a little bit what our crisis service focus is, and that's that there's a growing body of research now that's suggesting that while you're in poverty and certainly while you're living on the street, the crisis response that our body is affected by is really in full effect. And we're constantly sending through our bodies and to our brain fear and stress messages and those fear and stress messages, um, when they're being done day after day, time after time, it really results in an overloading of the system. Especially in youth, this can truly have some really um, staggering effects and compound some of the other difficulties that they're having. Next. 
or yeah. So what happens is that it triggers other responses in the body. Um, we're one ahead of you. Um, so it decreases their ability to solve problems, um, to set goals. They can't complete tasks effectively. And anyone who's worked um, along with individuals who are on the street or in any kind of crisis situation can see this. But for youth, they tend to have less coping skills to some extent, so they can really respond with even less desire or opportunity opportunity to address that um, situation that they're in and the current reality. And typically, they're looking for a quick exit from what quote unquote reality is. And youth who have not really had a future will find it difficult to vis visualize a future. Um, and decisions that they make are really made with great difficulty. Um, it's inappropriate at times because it's based on a crisis rather than actual reasoning that we might use um, when we're not in a crisis situation. Next. And it's important as a provider for us to consider all of this when we're developing our program, when we're identifying how to move forward, how to serve those youth. Um, we need to understand this crisis focus. We need to recognize it when we're serving them. And because you all have different programs, you need to develop skills and tools that really can help you in your process of working with that individual. And recognize that because they already have this crisis response, that when um, they're even housed and their housing comes under um, threat for whatever reason, including their own actions, that crisis response tends to kick back in quickly because of the stress levels increasing. Next. So in a housing first model, we've been doing housing first here at, um, at our department for almost two decades. And not because it was a model then, but it's because what worked for us. And we found it particularly useful in engaging individuals who have co-occurring disorders and who aren't really served well in traditional housing or residential programs. Next. I lost you. Um, I have the harm reduction as part of Housing First slide yeah. on my end. Okay. Opportunities for um, this provides opportunities for us to have dialogue around um, what an individual is struggling with without it jeopardizing their housing. And a lot of times that allows for more honest conversation, more opportunity to work through within the barriers, their choices, especially around that substance use. And what we've found is that it's truly necessary to recognize that sexual health and substances are, co are a component that kind of connect, especially for youth. And having those conversations with them should be around how are they acquiring substances? What is the lack of choice? when they are under the influence, how that affects how they're able to have choice in, in anything. And it's really important to use to have choice. So this is a good opportunity to address it with them. Next. But being homeless um, for any reason pulls away for an individual their sense of self-worth. It strips it away day after day. And soon there's this lack of hope a lack of ability to really be able to look at things and believe that it can ever be different. And for a youth, this is especially true because many have never had positive encouragements or statements about them made by adults in their lives or even a belief that they have value already. So once they're on the street and you're trying to move them into housing, it's critical for you to recognize that. And this has, has a lot to do with what are the motivating factors to change things? And if you all think about it, 
you'll recognize that belief that things can change is one of the key motivating factors. You have to have hope. You have to believe that it can be different or you're not motivated to change things. And there also needs to be opportunity. And that opportunity can be a motivator as well. But you, as a service provider, may have to help them to believe and to hold the hope that things can really change, that this can happen in their lives. And I, I just want to challenge you to think about what happens if you don't believe that things can change for them. It's really critical for you to always have that focus that it is possible for this individual. Next slide. This, I put this up here because often everyone talks to me about this, that does everyone deserve a home, including a youth who's not choosing sobriety? How can you put someone into housing who's using? And I think that it, it is important for us to decide how we feel about this. I'm not going to say what's right or wrong, but I think it's important for you to know how you feel about it because your opinions affect your service and thereby can um, limit the client's choice and the client's outcomes. And you need to recognize where you're at on this so that you can shift and change. So how do you house youth who are choosing not to practice sobriety? You need to remember, one, that housing doesn't have to be a deterrent, but a housing crisis will certainly be one. I have yet to see a youth shift the dynamics while they're actually living on the street. It's important to have person-centered focus, to make connections where they're at, not where we desire them to be, to have intensive housing supports to wrap around them, not just monthly clinics, but daily, weekly visits in their home as well. Um, an integrated team, and for us, the housing resource pe specialists are a key piece to that. Um, we focus on harm reduction, um, har harm reduction, we focus on trauma-informed care, all of those pieces, but we also utilize our team of housing resource specialists to keep a good neighbor focus, and we'll touch on that briefly. Next slide. So here's the fundamental question, because if you're saying that a youth who is currently not sober should not be allowed into housing, or should not have that opportunity until they're able to change that. You're saying that it's better to leave them on the streets until something changes. Next slide. Evidence, though, doesn't align with that. Every day that they're on the street, it strengthens barriers to changing their future. It impacts that pattern of crisis. Safe housing affords them that opportunity to stop functioning in the urgency of a crisis, and it affords you an opportunity to meet them where they're at, to, to touch them and shift the dynamic for them while they're in housing. Next. So here are key factors um, we've found. You need to build trust and rapport, meet them where they're at, not where you expect them to be, Respect their choices, even if you disagree with them. Believe that they can change barriers and hold the hope for them. Next slide. So one of the key things I wanted to touch on is that sleep is a key component. When you're on the street, you're sleep deprived. And all of these things, all of the crisis increases, decision um, skills, um, become difficult, responses are heightened, thought processes become confused. But really the substance use increases because to counteract some of the sleep de deprivation, some of the responses that they're having. So what we focus on is what we call a good neighbor. It's, it's that it's the behavior that results from the use. That's our focus, allowing opportunities then to link back to what's the cause of those behaviors. Next. And we view it as a barrier. So it's a barrier to them maintaining their housing. So by identifying that end behavior, it invites that youth to discuss it, to imagine, and to modify. 
So these are um, what we use in our good neighbor meetings. We have one when they first move in. It's designed to kind of be allow the housing resource specialist to be quote unquote the bad guy. We focus on the housing and your barriers. And the case manager or wellness partner team can then focus on what we need to do to move you forward. Um, we give them good neighbor certificates for a certain amount of time in housing. We see them posted on their walls all the time. They want pictures taken with them. It's a, a positive reinforcement. Um, we do use warnings um, that you're at risk of losing your housing. And if they're refusing to engage with their case manager, sometimes we use those warnings to say, within the week, we by this date, we need a plan of action, how you're going to address this barrier. And you need to make that with your case manager. And they typically do follow through on that. So here's some of the rules, which you can see in the handout. Next slide. I just want to leave you with this as well, because I think we forget this. Um, when you have been on the street and you're moving into a home, especially a youth, um, you have hope that things are changing for the first time and you're moving into a home. Most of us would be thinking, oh, this is an exciting time. And yes, they're excited. They're um, often very grateful, but there's also a part of them that is concerned, that is fearful, that is afraid this is something new and I'm going to fail at it. Um, my past is going to come back and affect this. And I think it's important for us to understand that moving in doesn't change those barriers that got them out on the street in the beginning. It, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes practice. And we need to be open to understanding that they may lose their housing. Most of ours are in scattered site apartments. They may lose their housing, and but we, they don't lose the service. They don't lose the support and we help them find a new housing and move on and recognize that sometimes it just takes practice. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Lynn, um, for that presentation, for being part of this learning community, and for just always giving me personally so many incredible insights about how I can improve my own work. Um, and I think this little quote is perfect for the next segment of the meeting today. Not experts, just experienced. Um, because there are often some of the same frequently asked questions that come up in any conversation about Housing First and harm reduction. Um, what we decided to do this time is that a few of our experienced Rappery Housing for Youth provider members of the community would each take a stab at the most common questions um, from the perspective of their work in their program. And I'm going to try to unmute everybody, which I did not. And my apologies again to all of you for the technical difficulties. Um, I know that we all know that I'm a little bit technologically challenged. Um, so the three most common questions and concerns that we usually get around um, Housing First, Harm Reduction for Youth um, concern things like the why of doing Housing First, kind of like the philosophy behind it, the how of being a Housing First program and what that requires organizationally. Um, questions about what Housing First case management looks like, very practical tips. And then also, um, you know, the big one that Lynn has alluded to is navigating substance use with young people in a Housing First model. So those are the big important questions that we almost always get on this topic. So um, we're gonna have a, a few of our experienced providers now just um, cover each of those three questions from the perspective of their program. And, um, First up is my awesome friend, Julie Box, Senior Vice President of Programs at Pathfinders in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, Pathfinders is one of the first Housing First programs that I came across when I started here at the Alliance. And the passion uh, that the Pathfinders folks speak about why we should be doing Housing First for Youth has always been inspiring to me. So Julie, I didn't have a picture of you personally, so um, I decided to use a loving cat picture instead for your slide. And Perfect. You can go now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that cat looks much better than me anyway. 
Um, I don't agree with that, but it's adorable. Ah! Uh, really, the things about um, that the Pathfinders found out when we started doing housing, and I will be really honest, we did not use housing first. Um, we evolved into housing first, and we really thought about that because um, we thought we had to join the pack of everyone saying young people had to be ready to be housed. Um, and this just really isn't true um, because young people didn't know how to be tenants. They um, didn't, you know, they didn't know how to pay rent. They didn't know how to be neighbors. They didn't know how um, to do all of these things. Um, and we thought our job was that we needed to train them up and make them ready. Um, and what we were really doing was we were penalizing for them for something that they couldn't possibly know, really from a trauma-informed standpoint. They had no basis of understanding this. So we were like blaming them. And that's just really not okay. Part of it also was that this was just conflict in disguise. Um, we didn't want to have to have conflict with the landlord. We didn't want to have um, to negotiate and maybe you know, talk about the fact that, you know, the landlord was um, also not really being um, very understanding of what the developmental and the trauma background um, was going on with our young people. And so we were trying to avoid conflict and we made that our goal rather than working through conflict um, and, and focusing on what's the mission of the program and um, what did the young person need. Um, because when we focused on the mission and we brought landlords along um, and they met our young people and saw them as individuals, the reality is, is we've managed most of the conflict. There's been some that we haven't been able to, but our, we made a barrier of, for ourselves because we were just like, we don't want to lose the landlord, so let's just not have conflict. That was the wrong thing. The other piece is, um, you know, really for, um, you know, we had to own that the burden is on us. Um, the burden is on us under a housing first model to really establish that trusting relationship with young people so that they feel safe. That way they will learn to be good tenants. They will be open to working with us to learn those skills um, instead of us trying to impose something on them. Um, from a ter in terms of case management, it's really simple. Um, case managers need to be authentic, they need to be consistent, and they need to be trustworthy. Young people deserve that, um, and that is how to be in, in authentic relationship with the people that we're working with. Ooh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Look at that pop up. Um, and the other piece really about how do we manage um, drug use is that we really approach it from this functional perspective or standpoint. And we ask questions like, can you get and maintain a job doing what you're doing? Can you attend school? What do your neighbors think of this? Are they complaining? Do they not say anything? Um, and that ties into learning to be a tenant that I spoke about a minute ago. Um, is this interfering with your personal relationships? Um, is it cutting into your budget so you can't afford to get stuff? Um, and the, re answer, the answers were really then, um, you know, how's this working for your life? If, if drug use is, is interfering with your life, um, and your ability to be housed, then that then that really needs to be the conversation we're having. We also need to be um, really clear that it needs to through really using mo things like motivational interviewing in these in these cases, um, getting young people to see what do they need to change and why versus what do they want to hang on to. But we also were real. Um, if you have to have a drug test for your job, if you're on parole. Um, those are things that are not negotiable and we may not like them, but those are what the reality of life is. And so then we can talk about how you feel about them, but um, then that changes the conversation about drug use. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie, for those great insights. Um, and just a heads up, everyone, um, the webinar is had, uh, it was on the schedule for an hour, but it will be going to an hour 15 minutes. Um, and let's move right along. Um, we have another of our experienced Rappery Housing for Youth Learning Community members, John Lawler, the Director of Homeless Youth and Young Adult Programs at The Connection in Hartford, Connecticut. 
John, what's your experience at the Connection taught you about uh, these common questions about Housing First for Youth? Sure. I mean, uh, really similar to um, Julie's uh, history with the program, too. We did not necessarily start out as Housing First. We made a lot of the common mistakes of uh, requirements meeting with case manager on a weekly basis. Um, you know, if there's a lot of active use, we would have wanted to see you engage in treatment before we go ahead and house you. Um, and, and what we found is that that just really wasn't a, a long term successful approach. Um, so the housing first principles um, uh, kind of in parallel on our end uh, just started to, to make a lot more sense. So we uh, eventually evolved into that fairly early on in, into our program. Um, and I mean, on the organizational level, what that mean, what we knew that means that there was go, we're going to need a higher risk tolerance that we we're going to run into um, newer, more complicated scenarios with some of the landlords that we work with um, and, and really try to um, yeah, work with them on a more uh, kind of proactive basis uh, and, and just help them understand that we were never going to require uh, treatment of someone who is in drugs, but we were going to work with them to try to find the, the motivators uh, where it would not be problematic in, in their tenancy. Um, also, we spent a lot more time uh, developing trauma-informed care MI practices, particularly into the supervision with our direct staff, um, just knowing that really is a parallel process. The way that we work with our case managers is likely the way that they're going to work with their youth. Um, so really avoiding any uh, authoritative like content to their actions, um, to, to the conversation, um, and then just helping them explore what options that they think they have with each youth. Um, and really, uh, we spent a good amount of time uh, doing focus groups with some of our youth, trying to take a closer look at what would motivate them to engage with in services, not just our case management services, but other ones like mental health, job training, uh, et cetera. Um, so moving on into uh, the case management issues in Housing First, um, we did uh, adopt, um, understand that incentives were going to were much more successful than any type of requirements or stipulations. Um, so we did a good amount of work in terms of just getting um, soliciting donors for small amount gift cards, that kind of stuff that could at least uh, motivate them possibly to to get through the door of a mental health clinic, of a substance abuse uh, abuse clinic. Um, just to start to test the waters to see if it was a service that they'd want to try out. Um, and uh, also we have, uh, of course, my favorite, Eric Cartman, but the GIF isn't working. Um, but yeah, it's a little statement where he says, you know, how do I get through these keys? Uh, that's such a, a, a common um, test with our case managers is that frustration that, uh, you know, we're not necessarily, uh, you know, how am I going to get through to them without being able to use a program structure or some type of requirement for them to, to meet with us or do this or do that. Um, and a lot of our, our adjustment was just understanding that um, just because you maybe we maybe didn't get their agreement in that moment doesn't mean that they didn't hear you, doesn't mean that they it's not swirling around their head. And just understand we're as providers not looking for instant gratification from the youth that we're working from. Um, a huge philosophy, philosophy as ours for our case managers is to just keep showing up. Like that's the universal gap that these young people um, have not had in their lives or recently or in a lot of their histories. Um, but that's what it takes to establish that rapport, that buy-in, that trust from this, you know, very highly traumatized young person that's had very little stability through much of their life. Um, and on case management, and we really take a lot of time to focus on the relationship. And that's kind of our bottom line. All the other outcomes, um, whether it be employment, paying rent on time, money management, et cetera, the, the, the crux of that is the relationship between the case manager uh, and the client. So that's really what we have case managers focus on. Um, and also be ready because if they're not engaging with you, they will eventually um, need you at some point. That's been our experience. We don't always know when. Might not be today. Might not be tomorrow. Um, but to be prepared where they where that need surfaces, and then it's our time to shine as as direct care providers. Um, and also a difficulty with case management is always that concern, the pressure of the timeline that's inherent in rapid rehousing, and then that. Um, that need to, to get them self-sufficient. Um, and just uh, some of the, what we developed is just being able to augment the message um, of that timeline towards youth. We had, the idea is not to make them, you know, drive them to the point of toxic stress over it, um, but also kind of keep the reality um, within grasp and that, yeah, the point of this is to, to be able to move you on um, from needing this type of assistance. Um, and also just a lot of time spent discharging there that are uh, adjusting their discharge plan very frequently. Um, most of the youth that come into our program, their ultimate goal is just to have a place on their own. About a few months in, they start to realize, you know, okay, in a high cost state, apartments uh, cost being what they are, that might not be too realistic. So being able to adjust that plan um, also helps that 
uh, make the timeline of, of rapid rehousing a bit more feasible. We have a lot of youth, over half of our youth discharged to shared living arrangements, roommates, et cetera. Um, and also on the staff end, uh, trying to avoid being too helpful. It's uh, all these things that the youth experiences are not necessarily the case manager's job to solve. Um, it's really about using those MI skills and helping them learn that problem solving um, process and us being a resource to them uh, through that. Um, and in terms of drug use, it was covered pretty extensively at uh, the uh, harm reduction segment. Um, but we've also used other uh, tools like having uh, for youth that acknowledge that they, you know, use substances, um, having them set their own rules before they move in their apartment and, and stuff that they completely come up with. Um, and we kind of have them or, or we'll put them in writing, writing for them, but it's in their own words. And it's just a standard that they plan to hold uh, themselves to. So that way they kind of create their own rule book. Um, and, and as they, uh, you know, hit experiences where they might have violated it, um, they eventually become accountable to themselves. And we just kind of say, uh, okay, look, here's what you had put forth. Uh, you know, what do you think happened? What do you think we'll, we'll, you, you can plan around for next time? Um, and as much as possible, just trying to find other activities to take the place of, of the use. Um, and so that's a big part of developing that individual menu of service options is finding other stuff for them to get involved with um, that can occupy some of their time, especially if it puts them around other young people who are uh, positive influences on them. Um, it, then, then you kind of get some of the advantage in terms of the harm reduction or, or their sobriety, if that's their goal, of being able to utilize that peer network um, that, that might also be able to help reduce or eliminate use. Uh, and, and yeah, that's pretty much been our experience uh, over the past five years so far. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, so many great points that you made there. And I have to say to John particularly, thank you for jumping on the fun GIFs and memes bandwagon with me. Um, <laughs> finally, we have the wonderful Beth Holger Ambrose, uh, Executive Director of The Link in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, Beth, we can't wait to hear your insights about implementing Housing First for Youth, especially since The Link has been committed to that approach for so long. But I do want to let the audience know that um, I initially wasn't, oh, I missed it, shoot. Sorry, hang on a minute, everybody. That's okay. <laughs> Clearly, I am not on my game today. There we go. Um, so I initially wasn't sure I would have a picture of Beth in time to add to this slide, so I decided to use one of a white-tailed deer. Um, because Beth is such a deer, but also because apparently the white-tailed deer has been proposed as the state mammal of Minnesota at least eight times, but has been voted down each time, um, which is one of the many little tidbits of trivia that you learn when you um, go into Google Images. So um, here's a lovely Minnesota outdoor image for you all, and here's the lovely Beth to share her wisdom on Housing First for you. Well, thank oh. you so much. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on this webinar. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. So first of all, we were, uh, the Link as an organization was an early adapter of Housing First. I cannot take complete credit for that, although I have been part of that. Um, our housing staff have been really believers in this Housing First approach for uh, many, many years, which is wonderful. And so what we have is um, at the Link, we're based in North Minneapolis, and we currently operate eight housing programs. And to save time, I will just give you the one sentence overview that four of them are considered rapid rehousing programs and one of those four is for young families and one of those is also culturally specific for lgbtq youth we also have in addition to that four housing programs that are considered permanent supportive housing programs and out of those one is specific to youth who have experienced sex trafficking so that's just to give you a little bit of a background of our what we do for housing and um, as an earlier adapter of Housing First, we really did um, have gone through a lot of very interesting conversations with our funders, our partners, um, different systems partners, and even some of the other homeless youth organizations um, within the state. And I think we've all learned and grown a lot, including myself and the link as a result of those conversations throughout the years around Housing First. We've also, it goes to, it goes without saying, we've also had many, many interesting conversations with our property owner and management partners, as well as market rate landlords around this topic. 
So um, basically what the link does is that we do not require youth to meet certain income requirements. We don't require youth to be sober to come into housing or to have a clean criminal record. And we also work with youth that have high degrees of mental health, chemical dependency, fetal alcohol syndrome, youth who have been victims of trafficking, gang involvement, and or domestic in violence involvement. And I completely recognize that really the vast majority of youth housing providers are working with a very similar population. It's definitely not just the link, uh, but we do not um, we work with obviously a very highly vulnerable population and do not require them to go through a series of hoops to get into housing. We believe that housing is a basic human right and we wanna provide that first without making any bureaucratic um, nightmares for young people who are already in crisis. We also, um, in terms of incorporating Housing First into our rapid rehousing program specifically, you can imagine it's been at times very challenging because, and I really credit our program managers, housing coordinators, and case managers for working very diligently with our market rate landlords within the Twin Cities area. Some of them are amazing and completely on board, but some of them it's very difficult and they want to, as a landlord, evict a young person who, um, you know, maybe they're not taking out their garbage and they have a bunch of garbage bags outside of their apartment building, or maybe they have guests that are really disturbing the peace in the building or, or um, damaging property, et cetera. Um, have an abusive partner that's caused issues within the building. So there are a wide number of reasons why a landlord um, may want to evict a young person. And so what we kind of did at, throughout our development of our rapid rehousing is really work with our market rate landlords to encourage them to use what's called a mutual lease termination so that instead of evicting the youth if first of all we do advocacy to try to get the landlord to be able to change their mind and adapt to a more housing first approach but if that's not possible then what we'll do is we'll encourage the landlord to do um, what's called a mutual lease termination rather than an eviction which you know goes on the young person's record. And then um, our housing coordinator and case management staff will then work on rehousing the young person with a different landlord and apartment within the community versus um, a non-housing first approach would be to exit that young person from the program. And so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of how we have you know, worked with, um, worked with landlords. And like I said, it's, it can be extremely messy. Um, it requires a lot of hard work and creativity and really a lot of negotiation with landlords to make all of this come together. Um, but that is definitely one of the key examples of how, um, how we are housing first. In terms of housing first case management, I think housing case management, case management in general and case managers are the key to incorporating housing first on a day-to-day -day basis within our rapid rehousing programs. And I think it's really good and we encourage our case managers to be extremely creative about helping young people that they're working with figure out positive and strength-based ways to be able to maintain their housing stability. And by the way, a lot of this I hope is not complete repeat of what my um, colleagues and the experts just talked about because I really am in agreement with, with um, so much of everything that they said here. So at any rate, um, we try to encourage our case managers to be incredibly creative. Lots of them have very good ideas. The young people have good ideas, of course. And so one of the things that um, that we've done with some some youth, for example, is we've had some youth that are suffering from pretty significant mental health issues and or chemical dependency issues and have a really tough time and will actually admit to us that they have a really tough time managing guests. And when they're in a scattered site unit, it's really difficult because it's not one of our site-based programs that we have staff 24-7 where we can help monitor guests and help young people because we have staff there all the time. And so in the scattered site programs, um, when youth, I, I remember one youth in particular um, a situation, but when a youth comes to their case manager and or their case manager is noticing, hey, you know, every time I come out here, there's five or six youth that are popping out of the closets or there's a lot of extra clothing and a lot of extra um, you know, things in your apartment, it's obvious there's there's other young people crashing here. Are you okay with all of this? Because we're really worried that if the landlord finds out there's more than just yourself living here or that you have these continual guests that you may get evicted. Um, do you want me to help you create some kind of specialized guest policy so that you can kind of use that as your crutch or your excuse with your guests so that because this particular young person had a really hard time saying no to anyone. And so, um, so for him, it was really important to kind of have the link, have a policy that they could 
say, hey, these jerks at the link are saying that we can't have, that I can't have guests anymore, can't have you live with me, otherwise I might lose my housing. And so basically we developed these specialized, somewhat fake, non-official guest policies that youth could use to just help them manage their guests. Um, we also, some of the young people, one of our program managers has done a lot around researching it because we have a lot, large number of youth that have um, been diagnosed or screened for fetal alcohol syndrome. And so she's done a lot to really work with young people around doing things like setting timers off to remember to turn off the oven, water, et cetera. And just really some of those things that it might be tough um, for a young person. It might seem simple to anyone else that's not. Um, that doesn't have this particular diagnosis, just reminders of or things that'll work for the young person to help them remember some things that can keep them safe in their apartment, can keep the damage to a minimum in their apartment and keep them safely housed. Um, we also have really truly help young people and again, our day-to-day -day, um, cleaning of their apartment. Um, and basically, let's see here. Um, we really try to work with each young person from a very strength-based perspective and figure out whatever the issue is. So if it's that a landlord, again, is we, we have a lot of um, issues with guests. So if we have a landlord that's complaining about a guest um, and the guest making too much noise and disrupting other residents and they've been, you know, getting complaints from neighbors, then that's when our case manager can kind of come in and work with the young person to say, hey, let's figure out what's going on with these guests. Is there a policy I can make? And then that same case manager can go back to the landlord and or the housing coordinator and kind of propose what we're working on with the youth and try to mitigate them from getting their lease terminated versus saying, that's it, you've had another guest stay in your home, you're out of the program, the link's not going to work with you anymore. So those are kind of some of the examples that I think day-to-day -day case managers are so important in. Last but not least, and all of, I should say, all of the case, our case managers, case management is really centered around, in terms of housing first and harm reduction, really centered on, um, like other people have said before, helping youth learn how to manage whatever behaviors or situations they have um, in the context of remaining housed and maintaining their housing stability. So we really, it focusing on that, focusing on maintaining housing stability, takes so much of the accusation type of um, or defensiveness away because we honestly just say, nor case managers will just say, hey, I am on your side. I'm really trying to help you keep your housing. Um, but there's this issue that's come up with, you know, the landlord or some of the neighbors that I want to help you with. And so if I, if we don't make some changes here, um, and I know it's not your fault, but if we don't make some changes here that are going to work for you as well as the community, you may lose your housing. And just really having the conversation focused in like that, but also um, from a harm reduction or strength-based perspective. And then in terms of drug use, this is the big one. Um, when I saw Mindy had this question, I was like, of course, this is a very good one um, and also one that comes up a lot. And so even though the link does not have any sobriety requirements, some of our property managers do. And so um, what we have done is we have um, advocated that, you know, young people are able to come into the programs even if they um, are not you know, are not sober. And then what we do is really work with the youth on developing a safety plan, like an individual safety plan around um, what they're, you know, what they believe they can do to stay safer while using or potentially reducing use. And again, we focus this a lot around housing stability. So what types of, you know, if they're um, smoking weed, for example, they've smoked weed, they've gone in, back into their apartment, and they're by themselves and very quiet. Most likely, no one will ever get wind of that. And but if they're if they have 12 people in their apartment and they're sell and someone's selling weed out of their apartment, that could be a huge you know issue. So we try to work with the youth case by case to really focus on what kinds of behaviors associated, like other people have stated, that are associated with the alcohol and drug use that can um, disturb their housing stability and try to really help them from that. And then oftentimes from those conversations, it leads into, you know, I really, you know, eventually at some point a youth might say, I really want to make a change. I want to go into treatment. And one of the things we've done is if a youth does make that decision um, and they go into treatment for three weeks or a month, we will hold their apartment for them and help them pay their rent to make sure that they have that apartment when they come out of the treatment center. 
Um, the other things that we've kind of done to be, to be housing first is that we have had our staff attend, our, a lot of our housing staff have attended Narcan trainings and so know how to um, help support a young person if there is an overdose. We also um, have created, like I said, individual safety plans that case managers can do with young people really around strength-based based approaches to talking through drug and alcohol use. We have identified as, although there is definitely a shortage of um, adolescent chemical dependency treatment for in and outpatient, we've, our staff have done a great job of finding out what those resources are and then making those available as options to use, not mandatory, making it mandatory, but making those types of things as options to use um, to coordinate when the youth want to participate in these. So I hope that this is helpful. So much of all of this is built, of course, on the relationship that the youth has with the staff. And so, uh, again, a lot of our focus with case management is on building relations, positive relationships, too. One last thing that's come up um, recently um, is that, or actually a few years ago, um, in one of our site-based housing programs, um, they developed a peer-led sobriety and addiction support group which is wonderful. And so now we're really trying to replicate that in some of our other programs, you know, just so that youth can kind of lead the charge on developing some support around that that makes sense for them. So I hope this was helpful. If there's anything else you'd like me to speak to, let me know. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, lots of great insights from everybody. Um, and my apologies again for the technical difficulties on my end running the shows that put us a little bit behind. Um, so I think that we're probably not going to have time to get to the, the formal Q&A. Um, Laura Foster, I see you jumped on and, um, and I'm sorry that we ran over. Um, but everyone, email addresses are here on the Q&A slide. Um, we do have your questions compiled from the question box. Ben has stayed on and has been answering some of them as he can. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us um, in the meantime and look for um, a compiling of questions along with answers in the next uh, Reverie Housing Newsletter. I'm going to speed through this one and just really quickly mark your calendars for the next meeting of the learning community, which will be on November 2nd. Um, be on the lookout next week for the learning community newsletter, which will have a link to this webinar recording and all the other helpful resources for improving rapidly housing for youth in your communities and programs. Again, my apologies for the technical difficulties and running over time. Thank you to the panelists um, and thanks everybody for being a part of the Rapid Housing for Youth Learning Community.